Um, so I want to thank the organizers for the invitation. Um, this talk really takes this thought provoking theme of the cybernetics of the 21st century or the cybernetics to come to introduce my new book, uh, China and the Wireless Undertow, Media as Wave Philosophy. So what the book does is it really engages with our uh, with the fact that our conceptions of the future, our sense of the 21st century, has become very much tied to an apprehension over the intense entanglement of the rise of China and the ubiquity of wireless waves. I use the term wireless to stand in as a kind of stand-in term for planetary computation or uh, AI or digital machines. And it will become clear why I'm uh, emphasizing the wirelessness uh, of these mediums as uh, I continue. So as is well known, cybernetics as initially conceived was of course understood primarily as a science of control. And likewise, the relationship between China and wirelessness has come to be thought pre predominantly through the lens of what, what is now commonly referred to as techno-authoritarianism, a kind of extreme form of centralized control. Um, China's, uh, as is also well known, China's techno-authoritarianism reached a level of heightened severity during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic when the regime used an elaborate system of epidemiology, mobile phones, and QR codes to create a social system of, of what became total control. However, just as in cybernetics, where the primary force of negative feedback that creates systems of stability, uh, equilibrium, and homeostasis is often paired with the opposing force of positive feedback, which uh, you know is characterized by destabilization, runaway forces, and far from equilibrium states. So the relationship between China and techno-capitalist modernity has oscillated between what is often um, commented upon as a dystopian techno-authoritarianism and uh, this contrasting force, which is often talked about as a techno-liberation. So here uh, we see the signs of a real intense dissent that happened both online and offline during the uh, Shanghai lockdown. So it's it's quite clear to those of us who are watching this space that um, focusing solely on either side of this polarity can only ever offer a limited feedback. So whether that's negative feedback or positive feedback, contraction or expansion, uh, acceleration or deceleration, territorialization or deterritorialization, techno-authoritarianism, or techno-liberationism. These forces together, and this is my argument really, that these forces together uh, form a wave. And focusing only on one side or the other uh, is always limited because it fails to apprehend the whole of the wave. So the book that uh, I've just published uses the figure of the wave to reimagine the relationship between China and wirelessness. It does so by focusing on waves of various scales, from the long, slow rhythms of techno-cultural history to the high-speed frequencies of electric electromagnetic machines. Its philosophical argument is that these empirical, concrete, phenomenal waves uh, are the expression of a deeper, more intrinsic reality that is characterized by continuous wave-like change. 
So let me start to unpack this by uh, turning to this threshold event that happened on December 1st, 2018, when uh, Meng Wanzhou, the chief finance officer and uh, deputy chairman of Huawei, one of the largest and most important telecom companies in the world, was arrested at Vancouver Airport in Canada for extradition into the United States. Meng, who is the daughter of Ren Zhengfei, and was widely seen, who's the Huawei founder, was widely seen to be the successor of one of China's most powerful IT firms. And she was accused of bank fraud in Can when in, at the time of her arrest, she was accused in Canada of bank fraud uh, in relation to an alleged shell company that had uh, that was charged with violating U.S. embargo on Iran. Lurking in the background, however, what this arrest was sort of really about um, was the fact that uh, China had a much more intense role in the infrastructure buildup of fifth generation wireless media. So techno-capitalism, as the very term 5G signals, arrives in waves. The first generation of mobile technology, which could only make and receive phone calls, was launched in Tokyo in 1979. Since then, a new generation of cellular networks has been introduced every decade. Each generation uses faster technology capable of accessing higher frequencies of the electromagnetic spectrum. The, each of these opened new channels of communication. 2G allowed for text as well as voice calls. 3G, which was unveiled at the turn of the millennium, was based on an even more radical innovation. In enabling mobile data, 3G networks powered the global spread of smartphones that quickly came to alter even the most intimate details of everyday life. 4G, which was used throughout the 2010s, shifted the user experience by enabling the streaming of content and the rollout of 5G, which is taking place throughout the 2020s, is tied to the Internet of Things and to the uh, widespread or ubiquitous emergence of AI. Uh, so Huawei played an enormous role in creating the infrastructure of 5G. Uh, and it, this was really the first time a company that was not North American or European was involved at this level of telecommunication infrastructure. So at the time of Meng's arrest, Huawei was the only company in the world that was able to affordably produce all the elements of a 5G network. Around the world, Meng's indictment, which was followed by boycotts of Huawei, functioned as a kind of turning point, a sudden show, a sudden realization that the rise of China and the advance of wireless media were inextricably linked. So how can we understand this? Uh, one way I want to argue is to show that this alignment between China and wirelessness and the underlying machinic infrastructure of wirelessness, of wireless media, is itself an event in the wave-like nature of techno-capitalist history. And I do this by talking about K-waves. So K-waves, or Kondratiev waves, are named after the 1935 essay, The Long Waves in Economic Life, which was written by the Russian economist Nikolai Kondratiev. Um, Kondratiev posited the existence of 50 year or long cycles that create a kind of undulating rhythm to how capitalism works. This idea was taken up most famously by Joseph Schumpeter, who argued for what he called evolutionary econo economics. Importantly, capitalism for Schumpeter is a process, not a thing. Cycles, he wrote, are like the beat of the heart. They are the essence of the organism that displays them. So uh, as a cybernetic system, capitalism here is understood as a cybernetic system with its own internal rhythm. And this rhythm develops through mutations which regularly disrupt the constant equilibrium. 
and create this wave-like pattern. Um, what these waves fundamentally describe in the K-wave theory is uh, technological innovations or mutations and the ways in which these innovations spread through society. So there are a few critical uh, observations of wave theory that I wanna point out. I elaborate them in the book, but here I'll just sort of point to them. The first is that technological innovations are not evenly spread out. Rather, they tend to cluster according to the wave. And particularly, they cluster at the bottom of the wave. So in 1844, um, you have the first telegraph me message. In 1896, Marconi received a patent for the radio. Here in 1946, 1948, around is you know around the time of the Macy conferences. So the second ob observation is uh, that these um, waves ripple across the earth in such a way that they have a spatial as well as a temporal component. So this idea of geographic innovation in accordance with to K waves is really um, best articulated by the K wave theorist Carlota Perez. So let me just sort of spell this out by, by reading something out here. Uh, and I'll go through uh, this diagram a bit. The first Kondratiev wave, uh, had Britain at its center was based on core technologies of coal, iron, and steam. During the downturn of the first wave, which lasted until the mid 1840s, foundations were laid for a new planetary infrastructure consisting of steel, railways, steamships, and the telegraph. Right? These platforms served to power the second wave which is generally said to have lasted from the latter half of the 1840s to the late 1890s. And in this period, the heart of technological change moved from Britain to uh, Germany and uh, America. And again, revolutionary in uh, uh, technology was introduced in the final decades of the down cycle of this wave. So in 1876, Alexander Graham Bell was granted a patent for the telephone. In 19, 1879, Thomas Edison lit up his laboratory at the Menlo Park with the incandescent light bulb. In 1886, Carl Benz was granted a pattern for the modern car. In 1896, at the bottom of the wave, Marconi received his patent for the radio, the first patent ever issued for a Hertzian wave. So the dissemination of these technologies uh, powered uh, the, sorry, the dissemination of these revolutionary technologies and the socioeconomic and machinic mutations that came in their wake energized the third wave, the electric age, which is most commonly dated from the mid 1890s to just after the Second World War, with a peak right before the 1929 crash. The downswing of the third K wave brought the mass industrialization of electronics and the beginnings of digital computing. The transistor, which was built, uh, which was invented at Bell Labs in 1947, so here uh, in this downturn, uh, was one of the key technologies that opened the fourth Kondratiev, uh, the digital age, which had its peak uh, with the oil crisis and the end of the gold standard in the 1970s. And maybe I have to move this to see. Um, and this triggered the downswing that ended the long fourth Kondratiev boom. During the downturn in the latter decades of the 20th century, the telephone and computer converged. This coincided with the deindustrialization of America uh, and the outsourcing of these technologies and the making of these technologies to Asia. So at this point, the timing of the cycles becomes more speculative. It is plausible, however, to date the end of the fourth wave to sometime around the turn of the millennium with the bursting of the dot-com bubble. In this interpretation, the theory uh, of the wave, sorry, in this interpretation of the theory, we have now entered the fifth wave, 
the wireless wave to which China is so intimately tied. Uh, the early 2020s, right? This is the time when 5G is set, it kind of starts rolling out, um, occurs just as the wave is hitting its crest. And if the pattern holds, the new technological platforms of high-speed electromagnetic vibrations will host the evolutionary mutation that normally accompany a downturn, which, which is due to end sometime in the middle of the 21st century. So, uh, you know, this was published, or I, I made this graph before 2020, um, and, I, you know, we're, we're somewhere in the downturn and we're uh, in this moment of AI and IoT, and the idea would be that this would then power the next boom. So I want to move now to another kind of wave, electromagnetic vibration. And the argument, uh, the real argument of the book is that there is a convergence between the fifth K wave and 5G. And this concurrence of the fifth Kondratiev wave and the implementation of 5G involves the coming together of two types of waves, which occur at radically different scales. K waves give shape to historical time. Their long, slow cycles take more than half a lifetime to complete. The high frequencies of electromagnetic vibrations generated by 5G, on the other hand, constitute immersive fields of vibrating energy, which operates in five fragments of time too small to perceive. In the fifth long cycle of techno-capitalist time, with the rollout of fifth generation cellular networks, these two kinds of waves, which occupy radically different frequencies converge. It is within this fifth wave concurrence that China's geopolitical rise has become increasingly intermeshed with the infrastructure of our wireless world. So again, the relationship between China and wireless media is thus determined by the confluence of two distinct temporalities. One is described by a cyclic theory, which postulates the ongoing rise and fall of K waves that governs the rhythms of planetary, technological, economic, and geopolitical change. The other is the high-speed, non-human frequencies of electromagnetic vibrations, which form the material substrate, or what I call the abstract infrastructure of wirelessness. So critical infrastructure studies, uh, you know, which is a, a big topic in media studies, has a call to make the visible, the, the invisible visible. And they do this by often focusing on the stuff of media infrastructure, undersea cables, overhead wires, antenna trees, data centers. Electromagnetic waves as the ambient infrastructure of wireless media makes this project harder. It offers a kind of, a, you know, a kind of limit point. Because by their very nature, the frequencies of wireless media are not acceptable, uh, accessible to human perceptual apparatus. So in response to this, there's been like this whole series of apps and visual representations and, and artist projects that uh, try to vis visualize these invisible waves. So there's apps like the architecture of radio here, uh, which, so which visualizes this and sonifies the Wi-Fi signal your mobile phone picks up, or the walks of artist Christina Kubitsch, who uses specially designed sensitive headphones to amplify the acoustic perceptibility of the electromagnetic waves latent in the urban environment, or video by artist Semiconductor, and here maybe I'll just play this a little bit while I speak. So these not only reveal the disguised telecommunication grids of the secular city, but also decode in a way that we can grasp with our senses the elemental cosmic forces hidden in the everyday. Wireless infrastructure, 
Our immersive media environment is constituted by imperceptible electromagnetic waves. So beneath the entanglements of hardware and politics, like the auctioning of the spectrum, the buildup of satellite and antennas, the boycott of Huawei, lies an earthly cosmic force, highly technological, but at the same time, wholly natural. Electric vibrations are the ripple effects of the Earth's iron core, uh, the iron ocean at the center of the world. Comprising one third of terrestrial mass, approximately 3000 kilometers below the surface, lies a semi-fluid metallic sea. Its solid inner core is wrapped by an outer core that consists of a 2000 kilometer thick layer of liquid metal whose currents and whirlpools bathe the planet in vast energetic fields. For much of human history, these uh, this electric uh, vibrations were not very well understood. And in some ways, one can argue that it is the intensive trajectory of modernity that is really about, what is this intensive trajectory about? It's about uncovering and learning how to wield this imperceptible, immersive, vibrating realm. In the late 19th century, when Henrik Hirsch first proved the existence of electromagnetic frequencies, he could see no practical purpose of his experiments. It is of no use whatsoever, he is uh, supposed to have said. This is just an experiment that proves Maestro Maxwell was right. We just have these mysterious electromagnetic waves that we cannot see with the naked eye, but they are there. Today, these invisible vibrations provide a communication channel that is occupied by increasing number of smart devices embedded in all aspects of life. Over the course of the 20th century, our electromagnetic atmosphere has intensified, powering machinic ground that grows ever more ubiquitous, autonomous, and sentient. Nowhere is this more so than in urban China, where a hyperdense network of mobile devices has completely transformed everyday existence. Mobile phones are used to access the largest e-commerce platforms in the world, QR codes are omnipresent and form the semiotic of a vast sharing economy that includes bikes, umbrellas, and phone chargers. WeChat, the immensely popular messaging app found on every mobile phone is used to talk to friends, colleagues, and business partners. Mobile payment platforms built by tech giants Alibaba and Tencent have become so successful that everyone from fruit sellers to street beggars has stopped using cash. During the coronavirus pandemic, mammoth internet platforms joined with government services to create a sensing layer of QR codes and mobile phone signals, which were used as an ep epidemiological tool, which I said at the start. So wirelessness in China has propelled an urban landscape that the book seeks to theory theorize as an emerging sentient city. So let me now talk about the final uh, sort of wave, uh, scale of wave, um, which is wave philosophy or a kind of cosmo ontology of the wave. So China, as I've argued, is today very much embedded with the technologies of electronic communication. But this has not always been the case. The history of China's relationship with technological modernity uh, is fraught and complex. And a lot of my book is engaged with trying to detail some of the complexity of this history. What I want to highlight right now is this famous response to technological modernity, which was developed in the late Qing period by intellectuals who recognized that they had to adapt to new technologies but still wanted to protect and preserve the culture from which they came. Their hope was to achieve a balance between the contrasting forces of what they perceived as a dichotomy between tradition and modernity. 
Their solution to this was to adopt technology as a practical tool, but in such a way that they could keep it sequesters so it would not contaminate the cultural and intellectual heritage they wanted to protect. To do so, they mobilized one of the most profound conceptual dualities of Chinese thought, Ti Yong, which has roots in Taoist, Buddhist, and Confucian philosophy. Ti Yong has a variety of loose English translations where Ti means body and is often translated as substance or essence or ultimate reality, and Yong roughly translated as function or application or sometimes even manifestation. Um, and this conceptual mobilization was most are famously articulated by a now very familiar um, slogan, Zhong Shui Wei Ti, Xi Shui Wei Yong, uh, Chinese learning as substance, Western learning for ap application. And my book spends a lot of time unpacking this slogan and looking into the various responses to it and also trying to think about the ways that even though it's seen as being uh, largely historical, it still resonates in lots of the, the debates around China in the, in, and the internet today. Um, but what I'm particularly interested in want to talk about today is the take up of Ti Yong by the philosopher Xiong Shi Li. Uh, so Xiong Shi Li is widely considered one of the most important modern philosophers uh, in China. He is understood as the uh, father of new Confucianism of the 20th century. Um, and like the Qing reformers, Xiong embedded an engagement with modernity through a real re-articulation of Ti Yong. He believed, however, he criticized his contemporaries, believing that they did not possess a true understanding of the concepts they were mobilizing. So the new Confucian approach that he uh, sort of helped pioneer, you know, was not trying to partition what was being understood as a modern technology that comes from outside and keep it away from a protected internal tradition. Rather, it was trying to find a way of confronting the inherent exteriority of technological modernity by searching from within the tradition. And I think arguably we can say that uh, the philosopher Mo, Mo Zongsan, was, uh, who was Xiong's uh, student, um, was probably the most successful at this project. But I'm not, I talk about him in the book, but I'm not gonna talk about him today. I want to make clear that modernity, uh, as it's articulated by these thinkers, is shaped by a multiplicity of forces. So Xiong's own thought should be understood uh, very much within this multiplicity. Uh, it's important to highlight especially the influence of the revival of Yogacara Buddhism, which uh, John Mackham in this collection, uh, this is a quote, writes, is the main exemplar of Indian thought in modern China and was, in the end, just as important in shaping the Chinese response to modernity as the radically new knowledge systems introduced from the, the West. I also want to highlight the influence of Wang Fuzhe, a neo-Confucian philosopher heavily influenced by the I Ching and its Qi-based cosmology, that was also uh, kind of revived by the intellectuals, particularly Hunanese intellectuals, uh, who were very influential of the time. So Xiong Shi Li synthesized these influences of a Qi cosmology and a Buddhist revivalism and argued that Ti Yong cannot be bifurcated in the way of the Qing, uh, the other Qing reformists. Um, uh, that this popular slogan uh, was trying to do. Instead, what is implied by his philosophy is that there, there is connection between Chinese tradition and modernity that can be found in older and deeper and the deeper relationship between T. Yong. So this is, um, if you look at the texts that uh, articulate T. Yong in the sort of Buddhist and Confucian texts in which this distinction is uh, initially articulated. 
For Xion, these terms do not return, refer to a mundane distinction between a past culture and a future-oriented technology, but rather point to a more profound dyad of ontological reality, T, and phenomenal manifestation, Yong. In Xiong's reformulation, there is an imminent connection between the two terms. Xiong insisted on the non-separation of Ti Yong, Ti Yong Hu Er. Ti and Yong are not two, he repeatedly wrote. His aim was to synthesize ultimate reality with the flow of ephemeral appearances. The way or Tao is not something distinct from manifestation's constant transformation, but together they embody a cosmo-ontology of the way. And here Shun is borrowing heavily from the I Ching and its cosmology of constant change. In his book, The New Treaties of Consciousness Only, he describes the constant transformation as emerging from the interaction of two opposing forces. She contraction on compression and P extension or expansion, which of course resonate with these cybernetic forces that I started with of negative and positive feedback. These two concepts are found in the discussion of the second hexagram, Kun, which consists of six broken lines. In the great commentary of the I Ching, Kun is the great and originating capacity to which all things owe their birth. In her stillness, she contracts, and in her movement, she expands. Kun expresses yin, the first hexagram, qian, which is composed of six unbroken lines and manifests pure yang, the creative, light, and active principles of the heaven. Chan symbolizes heaven, which directs the great beginnings of things, the commentary continues. Kun symbolizes earth, which gives to them their completion. To close a door is called Kun, to open a door is called Qian. One closing and one opening is called change. Together, Qian and Kun, the creative and the receptive, mark the opening and closing of the gate. This continuous pulsation of contraction and expansion forms the ceaseless flow of change. She, the tendency to contract, to condense, to close, to coalesce, to fold, is what produces the material world. As contraction consolidates, Xiong writes, it comes close to being matter. However, before it can totally solidify, it is meant by this internal but opposing force, P, the tendency to open and expand, which creates the world of the mind. These two contrasting forces are inherently intertwined like the swirling waves of the yin-yang diagram. Each side contains the seed of the other. One expansion, one contraction, it is this as, as if they had purposely set in opposition so as to create transformation. That's a quote from Xiong Shi Li. Every contraction and expansion constitutes a xana or thought instant, a Buddhist term for the smallest unit of time. Yet even those most minute moment of permanence is illusory. No dharma, Xiong insists, abides in time. One can't say first there is expansion and then there is contraction. Instead, ultimate reality is nothing more than thought instant following thought instant, each of which ceases as soon as it arises. It is not a previous movement continuing into a later moment of time that is called continuous, right, Sean? Rather, it is the ceaseless flow of moment upon moment of transformation since beginning of time. Writing in the early 20th century, Xiong is implicitly influenced by the electric world that was emerging all around him, likened this ceaseless rhythm of generation and extinction, wondrous and unfathomable, to an uninterrupted flash upon flash of lightning, a myriad, quote, a myriad of transformations that is continuous and without end. Uh, so Xiong Shili formulated this conceptual relationship between reality, T, and its manifestations, Yong, which views the twin concepts as inseparable and yet still distinct. 
in reconceptualizing this dichotomy at the turn of the century, just as China began to confront the new world of electric machines, Xiong opened an alternative way of conceiving the apparent dichotomy between cultural traditions of the Chinese past and a technological futurism that has long been associated with the modern West, not only in the Western world, but also inside China. The possibility of reconciliation rests on understanding that technology's essence is no different from its use. Its ultimate reality is inseparable from its myriad appearances. In this conception of paired forces of tradition and innovation, stillness and impermanence, centralized integration and disintegrating dispersion are manifestations of the complementary cosmic forces of contraction and expansion. Xiong's philosophy articulates a continuous process of transformation conceived as an underlying elemental undulation. This is both an expression of the way, a conception of tradition whose constancy comes from constancy comes from the endless flow of change, and also of the wireless undertow, the intensifying planetary electrosphere, which following Shengxi Li can be understood as a phenomenal instantiation of reality's ceaseless waves. And perhaps that's what's being pointed to here by the Wi-Fi uh, emblem that obviously takes from the yin-yang diagram, the most um, well-known symbol of Chinese cosmology. So I'm going to stop there. <laughs>